want to welcome you to Wednesday, uh, 1130 uh, lunch and Bible study. We do it during the lunchtime. Normally, we, we actually serve lunch here at the church and do it. But, of course, we're under the edict to stay home. Um, as far as the church, we can't assemble yet. Uh, so we're bringing it to you uh, through our Internet system uh, from Doctrinal Studies Bible Church in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, today, uh, we're in a series on Wednesdays called Let Not Your Hearts Be Troubled, taken from John 14, 1 and 27. And I believe this is our eighth lesson in this series. Let not, and it's a series designed uh, for the crisis of uh, the COVID-19 crisis we're in. And since it's worldwide, uh, we felt like we could design a series of studies that would uh, reach uh, a common ground of crisis in all the nations of the world that we can touch base with. And so we've designed a series of lessons. We started with John 14, 1 and went through John 14 a little bit and verse 27. And then we switched from there over to 1 Thessalonians 5, uh, verses 13 through 28, I, I think 12, from 12 to 28 where Paul closes the, his book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. This is his closing remarks to the church. And he talks about uh, how to deal, what kind of conduct and how which we should deal uh, during a crisis, uh, during those crisis situations of our life, no matter what they might be. And um, so we're, we're in that, in... Um, Verses 13 through 25, there are 16 present imperatives. Those are commands. They're standing commands in the Greek language. And what we've done, what I've done, is I've gone into that pool of 16 present imperatives, and I've pulled out specific studies that I think would be relevant, at least in my teaching, uh, for my people and and hopefully other believers that are facing this or other types of crisis in their life. Today we're in the fifth chapter, 517. And it's, uh, well, it, it, show, it looks like three words in the English, uh, two words in the Greek. Uh, pray without ceasing. You're probably familiar with that. It's kind of a famous... Uh, passage, I think often quoted, pray without ceasing, but maybe not understood, maybe not understood, uh, pray without ceasing, what could that possibly mean? So it's going to take me two lessons to really teach it, even though it's only two words in the Greek language. It's going to take me two lessons this week and next week to show you because of the adverb, the Greek word without uh, uh, pray without ceasing. Without ceasing is an adverb uh, related to praying, praying without ceasing. And because of the word, it's going to take me two lessons to teach on this subject, uh, which you'll understand as I get into my lesson today. Before we start, we always start to remind you as a student of the Bible that the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality in the church age. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be mental attitude sin, sins of the tongue, or vert sin. You have to confess that sin in order to get back to spirituality. 1 John 1, 9 says if we confess our sin. He's talking to Christians. 1 John 1. First John is written to Christians. He speaks to, to them. He says, if, if we, the writer John, if we, the writer John, a lot of people take that as an unbelieving passage. You can't have the we in there and it be an unbelieving passage. Uh, you just have to know the writing of how John writes uh, in his books. But if we confess our sins, name it, come into agreement, homo legeo, with God about what sin 
has brought us into carnality? What was the sin that put you into carnality? If we confess our sin, or it could be the sin, you don't even remember the one that got you in, but you know the one you're in, confess that sin. Confess whatever sin you know. Hopefully you know the first one because you keep a short list. But if you keep a long list, then the last one, let's confess it. Take care of this thing. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us. That cleansing restores us to spirituality. It's not a salvation issue, confession of sin in a believer's life. It's a spirituality issue, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Very important for Bible study. Uh, John 14, 26, the Holy Spirit is in our life, indwelling and present in our life to teach and recall the Word of God. That's important to you personally, and it's important to other people you share your faith with. You share the Word of God through faith. So I'm going to give you a moment to confess sin if necessary. Pray for your Bible study today. The Holy Spirit would teach and recall uh, and motivate you and push you forward in your spiritual growth momentum for Christ. I mean, this is really important. Let us pray. I give you a moment of silence. Well, Father, we're thankful today for these that have come our way by the Internet. Pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of this discussion on praying without ceasing. We're going to look at this adverb. Uh, we're going to look at it really strongly today. And we'll come back next week and, and further discuss what it means. But what does this mean, pray without ceasing? Uh, you know, prayer in itself is a wonderful thing, Father, to approach the throne of grace in time of need, find grace and mercy. But here we're told to pray without ceasing. I hope that we can bring an understanding to this in this hour and next week as well. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you have a study guide, if you don't, you know, get a, run, get a pencil and piece of paper and a Bible Take notes. It's Bible study. Let's get that done. And uh, there's two, two Greek words. The first word, praying, and if you have a study guide, you can go to doctrinalstudies.com, print it out, and they have it right with you. Uh, John Dyer, our key guy in the, on uh, the Internet work here at the church, does that for you. It's a wonderful tool. So the word praying, prosyukamai, is a present middle imperative, second person plural. The imperative makes that a command. Present middle imperative. The middle, the middle here, it, it ends in an O M A I. If you had your study guide, you would know that. That's a deponent verb. It, uh, it looks like a middle, but acts like a active. It's just the way it is in the Greek language, and uh, and it reminds you of under, understanding how to pray. And how God operates prayer in your life. I'll talk about that next week more than I do this week. Then the second word, without ceasing. This, this is a compound word. It's not really a compound word. What it actually has is the A on the front of this word is an alpha privative in the Greek language. And that's where you get the word without. In the English or other languages, we'd probably put a U-N or an I-M or something. But when you have this alpha privative, it means without. Without. And then the word that's here, notice that it's D-I-A-L-E-P-I-L-E-I-P-T-O-S. That's an adverb. It ends in an O-S, and that O is long. That makes that an adverb. Uh, so we have a dia le lepas or tas leptas, and this is an adverb. It is often quoted, but do you really understand what it means? Today I will teach you what it means, and I will show you how one way it's used today and another way it's used next week. Pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing is an adverb, 
modifying this verb. You know, an adverb modifies a verb. And what it does in the Greek language, and I suppose in all languages, it does in the English as well. But what it does, it paints a picture. It paints a picture. The adverb paints the picture of the, of the verb. So we got praying. So here is the picture without ceasing. So I've got to give you a picture of that today. What does that mean? And I'm going to, I'm going to show you one side of it. Next week, I'm going to show you the other side of it. But the adverb requires me to paint a picture for you without ceasing. What does that mean, Ron? I've got to paint a pic picture for you of how it relates to time, matter, place, degree, etc. You know, like an adverb. So let me begin by looking at this Greek word. It has the LA or the alpha privative on the front of the word that means without. That's what the word on the, that A. Now, the adverb word of this, D-I-A-L-E-I-P-T-O-S, in the verb form of that, in the verbal, not the adverb, but the verb form of that, it's D-I-A-L-E-I-P-O. D-I-L-E-P-O. And here's what that means. Now, you really need to get this. It means to leave between intervals of space and time without ceasing. All right? So what, when you have the verb, it means to leave intervals, to leave intervals between, intervals, between intervals of space and time. When you put the a on the front of it means without intervals of space and time. Without intervals. Now, I want you to really get that idea behind that because that's really important. It means to pray without intervals. You say, Ron, well, could you give me an example of that? In today's lesson, I'm going to give you an example of that. I'm going to give you one example of it. It would be a prime example. It should be clear enough to be able to see it. This would be one way of looking at this. Next week, I'm going to show you some more complicated ways to look at it. But here's the simple way. An example of praying without ceasing or without intervals of space and time regard to your prayer request. Jonah, the book of Jonah, Jonah, in chapter 2, inside the belly of the sea monster at the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea. Now remember our word, our adverb, praying without ceasing, without intervals of space or time. That if doesn't affect it. Praying without ceasing, without intervals of space or time. Inside the sea monster's belly at the bottom of the sea. In the second chapter of the book of Jonah is Jonah's prayer without intervals of space and time. It's a marvelous prayer, by the way. And it's a prayer in the time of a major crisis. A major crisis. Listen to the chapter 2, verse 1, as he opens his prayer to God. He writes, I called Cal Perfect out of my distress. Then Jonah, no, that was verse 2, excuse me, verse 1. Then Jonah prayed, it's a PL imperfect of Palal. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God 
from the stomach of the fish. Now, we know he was at the bottom of the sea when he got picked up. Seaweed wrapped around his head. He was at the bottom of a mountain under the sea, and seaweed wrapped around. That's chapter 1, wrapped around his neck as he goes on explaining in chapter 2. What is interesting in the Hebrew language, I wrote this on your paper, if you have a paper, when it says Jonah prayed, it's a hifpael. I know. I know. But let me tell you what a hifpael is, and so let me paint the picture a little bit. Now, you, you probably can picture yourself if you got swallowed by a sea monster and was inside the belly of it at the bottom of the sea, of the Mediterranean Sea. But a hifpael is what you call an intensive reflexive. <laughs> Let me say it in better words. He's screaming bloody murder. He's screaming bloody murder. Would, could you imagine that? That's a hifpael. <laughs> That's a hifpael and perfect. The Hebrew, when you have an imperfect, it means incompleted action. This is going on, and it's going to go on until his last breath. Either his last, last breath is going to be inside the sea monster, or God's going to answer his prayer, and his next breath will be on dry land. And he's going to scream bloody murder to God Almighty until one or the other happens. <laughs> There's nothing like the Hebrew. Hey, it's, that's the hifpael in that verse. A refle an intensive reflexive. In other words, the what's going intently inside him. Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the stomach of the fish. Now, I, I, I kind of laugh at that, but listen, I'm not inside with Jonah, so I'm just laughing at the Hebrew. I'm not laughing at Jonah's circumstance. Now I'm in verse 2. Now I'm in Jonah 2, 2. Jonah says, now Jonah reflects that he fell imperfect. He reflects. He said, I called. A cow perfect, which is completed action. He's going to tell you what he what he he cried bloody murder about to God. I called out of my distress that he feel imperfect. You know, he feel imperfect. That intensive reflection. I called out of my distress that it is a suffering distress of hopelessness, hopelessness apart from God. See, he was running from God. And God has got, God's got his attention. <laughs> Look, you may think that you can just run and go and do whatever you want now that you're saved, that you're under grace and you have the freedom. You ha that's true. Now, you can run like Jonah run. You can't run from God. God is everywhere in space and time. And in a prayer like this, you should be thankful that God is that kind of a God. You should be thankful that you have a verse 1. Jonah prayed to the Lord his God out of the stomach of a fish. I called out of my distress, the suffering distress of hopelessness apart from God. I called out of my distress to the, out of my distress to the Lord. And here is three words every person wants to hear inside the belly of a fish. He answered me. Now, God always going to answer if the prayer is according to his will. He hears what he hears. He's, you know he's going to answer 1 John 5, 14 and 15. 
We don't want to hear no. Even Paul didn't want to hear no in 2 Corinthians 12. I prayed three times. I got the same answer. Ah, there was no sense praying a fourth. Because he gave me the answer, my grace is sufficient. Jonah receives an answer. And he answered me. I cried for help. That's a cry of desperation in the Hebrew. Shawah. From the death of Sheol. You know what Sheol is to the Hebrew? It's the place of the dead. In the Greeks, they called it Hades. In the English, they call it hell. But it's not hell like the average person means. But the hell by the Bible student knows there are three parts. There's the place where the believer goes, the place where the unbeliever goes, and the place where the fallen angels of Genesis 6 are. He thinks that's where he is. In other words, Jonah was a dead man waiting to die. He's in the belly of a sea monster who swallowed him at the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea. I cried for help out of desperation from the depths of Sheol, and you heard my voice. God always hears your voice. He's your father, and you're his son. He always hears it, and he always answers it one way or the other. Jonah was a dead man waiting to die. He was a carnal, backslidden, spiritual believer, born again, under divine discipline. Hebrews 12, 5 through 11. Well worth your read, my dear heart. If you think that you can just go into a carnal life as a born-again believer and not be di disciplined by the love of God, you're far, far mistaken. You're far from the truth. Listen to verse 7, Hebrews 12, 7. It says, It is for discipline that you as a believer endure. It is for discipline that you endure as a son of God. What God wants to do is restore you. But when you're at the, in the belly of a sea monster at the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea, you don't have a lot of options. One option you do have in a carnal, backslidden, disciplined believer's life is to pray to God. Confess your sin. Commit to doing the will of God that got you into trouble, got you out of fellowship with God and got you in trouble the first time under discipline. Jonah, inside the belly of the sea monster, did the same thing that the prodigal son did in the parable of Luke 15, 17. He came to his senses And return to the will of God. You see, you learn the word of God to know the will of God to do the work of God. Jonah confessed his sin like you were told to do in 1 John 1, 9, which restored him to his spiritual relationship with God like in 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3, in your life as a believer. It was at this point, he went from hopelessness to hopefulness. Hopelessness to hopefulness. Of a life praying to be returned 
to do the will of God. Because if he gets out of that sea monster, the belly of the sea monster, nothing's changed in the heart of God about what he called Jonah to do. In the first chapter of Jonah, 1 through 3, he told him, I want you to go to Nineveh and preach the gospel of great salvation. He didn't want to do it. And now he's in the belly of a sea monster because he thought he could run his own life his own way because he had the freedom. Listen, you have the freedom to do the will of God. That's more freedom you ever had as an unbeliever. You don't, have, you don't have the freedom to do as you want and not be disciplined for it, not be held accountable within your Christian life. At this point, he goes from hopelessness to hopefulness of life. The hopefulness is to be able to return to life to do the will of God. Jonah in the sixth and second chapter, verse 6, you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. Because we have chapter 3 and 4, he's back on dry land, and he's headed for Nineveh to preach the gospel of grace salvation. You brought up my life from the pit, Sheol. Oh, Lord, my God. What a wonderful song we sing with that in it. Oh, Lord, my God. Oh, Lord, my God, how thankful we are. It is interesting to me when he says, you brought me up out of the pit. Jesus took that, which he was referring to, the belly of the whale. Jesus quotes, quotes that in Matthew, the 12th chapter, 38 through 40, when he talks about his resurrection from Sheol, the pit. Three days and three nights in the belly of the whale. It was prophetic, a messianic prophecy of Psalms 16, 9 through 11. Jesus was concerned that, that God would not abandon his soul to Sheol, but would raise him from the dead. See, his prayer was very similar. Not that he was a prodigal son. He was an obedient son that was about to go to the cross and die for the sin and the sinners of the world. If you'd like more information on that, go to Acts 13.35. There's a wonderful statement as the second chapter of Jonah closes. It says, Then the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah up onto dry land. Vomited him. Let me tell you, Jonah was glad to be a part of that mess. <laughs> it was no longer a dead man dying. He was a live man living. Here's a second point. Now, did you get my point, praying without ceasing? This was Jonah. Without intervals of space and time. It's a classic example of this adverb. It's also a classic example of where Jesus was in his burial of three days and three nights. The Bible doesn't tell us in Jonah he was three nights. Jesus tells us because it was important to him because he was going to have to spend three days and three nights. The Son of God knew it and told us how many days and nights Jonah spent. Point number two, I, I want you to see something about Jonah that maybe you can reflect on yourself. Seeking divine truth, 
regarding the choices you make in your life is always running the risk of discovering what you would rather not see or deal with in your personal life. <laughs> I know, I crawled a little bit inside your head there just a moment. Let's talk about Jonah. Not in the, bell, in the belly of the whale, but what got him there. That's my point too for you. Now you got to listen to me. I'm going to say it again for you. Seeking divine truth regarding the choices of your life, the freedom you have. I Listen, I can make my own choice. I do what I want to do. Seeking divine truth. Seeking divine truth regarding the choices of your life. That's what Jonah is now wanting to do. Is always running the risk of discovering what you would rather not see or deal with in your personal life. You see, when God told Jonah, I want you to do my will, Jonah slew and said, oh, yes, yeah, I'm right, I'm all over it in chapter 1. Yeah, I'll go do that right now, Father. What did he do? Went the opposite direction, got on a different boat, and went a different direction. Went as far away from the will of God as he could go. Like he could outrun God. <laughs> you talk about dumb. But isn't that us? Only later can we look back and say, oh, I was so stupid. What made me think I could? I know. I know. I know. Seeking divine truth at some point in your life. Listen, when this book opens, Jonah is seeking divine truth of God. What, what does God want of my life? What does he want me to do? And God reveals it to you, and then you run like a scalded dog the opposite way. Are you still running? Well, you know where it's going to get you? In the belly of a fish at the bottom of the sea. Because God loves you. And you're doing this to yourself. You're not doing this to God. You're doing this to yourself. All that running, all it does is destroy who you are. All your character. Look what it did to the prodigal son of Luke 15. Why is he running? Because he would rather run than discover what, would, what he would rather not see or deal with in his personal life. Yet, you see, this is what is necessary to find the joy set before you. You will never find the joy set before you until you come to grips with it. See, this life is no longer about you. Once you came into the, 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 Lord, the, into the salvation of Christ, it's all about Christ. It ain't about you. You've been bought, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. This is a good, you've been bought. Your body's not your own. It belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he put the Holy Spirit in it and made your body the temple of God. And that's a good thing. And you don't know it. Oh, you know it, but you don't believe it. Now, what Jesus wants you to do is get back in the game and no matter what God puts in your life, no matter what he tells you he wants you to do, you've got the confidence that all things work together for good to those that love God who are called according to his purpose. That Romans 8, 28. Hebrews, the 12th chapter, verse 2 Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. Who? You see that? Who for the joy, who for the joy set before him, out in front of him. Listen, you're going to have the cross. Listen, that's going to be a joyful thing for me. 
Will it involve suffering? Yes. The worst ever. Well, how can I go? Well, how can I possibly do the will of God and go through that? By knowing the joy of doing the will of God and knowing that God will never leave nor forsake and that on the other side is where the holiday is. That's where vacation is. That's where the good fun time is. For the joy set before you, the joy set before you. You know how you can have that? Word of God, Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit. Huh? Love, joy, peace. Love, joy, peace. That's instantaneous joy. The joy set before me. The joy set before me the joy from the Word of God. The joy set before me. The Word of God going through that difficulty. The joy of God going through that. Ministry of the Holy Spirit. Fruit of the Spirit. The joy on the other side of it. Victory in Christ. Being an overcomer. 1 John 5, 4. Faith that overcomes the world. That's what God wanted for Jonah. And that's what he still wants for Jonah. Out, whether in the whale, on the boat, running, or in the belly of the fish, set down and waiting, or back on shore. This is what God wants for your life. He's not trying to tear it up and destroy it. He's trying to bring it into a fulfillment. But you see, Jonah's got to stop running. You know who Jonah's running from? Now, I'm going to get, listen. You say, well, that's deep. Now, listen to me. You know who he's really running from? From himself. You can't ever run from God. What are you doing, Jonah? I'm running from God. That's impossible because God's always ahead of you. He's always ahead of you, and he's always with you. I will never leave nor forsake you. How can you possibly be running from God? That's an insanity idea. I'll tell you what it's always. You're not running from God. You're running from yourself. Listen, I've done that. It's a foolish run. It's a foolish journey. And you're not running from God. That's an impossible. You can't run from God. You can't outrun God. That's crazy enough. That's insane thinking. But what is true is you're running from yourself. You're running from yourself. Jonah was running from himself. And listen, to find, listen to me now, to find himself, he's come to God's got to come to grips with God. And God's will for his life. <laughs> I know you're not listening because you don't want to hear it. La, 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 la. I know that. You stay with me. Don't leave me at this time. I know. I know I've rustled your feathers. I know I've, ups I've upset your life a little bit, your apple cart. Stay with me on this. I'm telling you, you can never run from God. You run from yourself. And what you're running from is coming to terms with God is the person God wants, the person God wants in you. The person God wants you is like his son. You're a son of God, and he wants you to be like his son. He wants you to be like Christ who is obedient to the will of God. This is not brain surgery. This is not difficult, but it is important. This is Ephesians 4, 22, 23, and 24. Put off the old man by the renewing of your mind. Put on the new man, that new man in Christ. That God intended when he saved you in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Any man be in Christ. He's a new, he's a new, he's a new self. Now he's running from God. 
and God's going to bring that run into a screeching halt. What you do with that is really important. Your life's coming to a screeching halt if it hasn't already. You're not running from God. You're running from yourself. All God wants you to do is come to terms with him because you're his son, and he wants you to be like Christ, obedient to do his will, because it's always the best. You want to please God? Then do it by faith. Hebrews 11, 6. Romans 12, 2. Once you begin to learn how to put off self and put on Christ, Ephesians 4, 22, 23, by the renewing of your mind like Jonah's doing, God is doing with Jonah. He, listen, Jonah, God's taking Jonah to Bible study. You know what we call that? When you begin to take off the self and put on the Christ, get rid of me and get full of Christ, you know what we call that? We call that transformation. Romans 12, 2. Through the renewing of your mind. Transformation comes by the renewing of your mind. You connect Hebrews 4, 2, 20, 22, 23, 24 to Romans 12, 2. The key is the renewing of the mind. From self to Christ. From old man to new man. Eh? Why are you pushing back on me? Well, that's not the way I understood it. We do now. What are you talking about? It's not the way. Well, that's not the way it was taught to me. It's the way it's being taught to you because it's true. Here's the story of Jonah. What's your story? What are you running from? I'll tell you what it is. From yourself, from your own insecurities, from your own fears, from your own hang-ups. That's who you're running from. And listen, it's a futile run. You know, you're running. It's like these treadmills. You're, you're running. How many miles you run? Five miles. But you never went anywhere. You never seen anything. Never did anything. I know. Isn't that fun? I don't know. Jonah has convinced himself that he could make his own life choices apart from God's revealed will. And boy, that's a form of insa spiritual insanity. You need to read Galatians 1, uh, five, 5th chapter, verse 1 and 11, or 13. Ch Galatians 5, 1 and 13. It talks about freedom. Yes, you have freedom. Freedom to choose the things of Christ. You've been born again. The freedom you have wasn't. You never had freedom in the world. You had bondage. True freedom comes through Christ. You need to read Galatians 1, 5, 1, and 13. Well, Jonah's, Jonah's outside the whale, and he's on dry land. Notice he, God didn't spit him out, and he had to swim to shore. Because Jonah said, well, I did it all myself. I, uh, I, I got myself out of the, the whale. Oh, yeah, boy. I did it all myself. I, 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 don't, I prayed and, and, uh, and uh, scared the whale, and, and uh, he got sick and threw me out, and I swam. I swam all the way. I'm here because I swam four miles. You know, even grace carried him. So the, he could have to see the whole picture. When he confessed the sin and got back with God, God, g listen, God took him to shore and spit him out onto dry land. In other words, he just shot him out. Whew, went right over whatever, wh wh hundred, uh, the last 50 yards or whatever he had, just shot him out and he, he, he landed on dry land. How'd you get there, Jonah? I, I don't know. The uh, whale just went, the big sea monster, it just went and a big stream of water and threw me out here. I don't know. Grace. <laughs> Grace of God. What kind of... No fish does that, Jonah. I know. <laughs> I know. See, listen. You know what Jonah said? The Lord commanded the fish. And he shot me out all the way to dry land. <laughs> It's kind of like one of these things that you see at a fair, you know, where they put them in a can and shoot them out. 
I don't know. I'm just telling you what goes through my mind. When he got on dry land, God says, let's have a meeting. Let's have Bible study. Jonah said, oh, I'd be glad to go to Bible study. You know what he did? In chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, he taught him the same lesson that he taught him in chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, when he, when he went to running from God. <laughs> and he, you know why? Jonah had to return to the place in the will of God that he failed to walk by faith. He brought it back to Bible class. Guess what we're going to study? What? The same lesson that we studied when, when you ran away from me. Because my desire is for you to do my will. Listen to what the Bible says. Third chapter, verses 1 and 2. Now the Lord came to Jonah the second time. <laughs> People go like, how many times are you going to preach that, Ron? As many times it takes you to learn it. <laughs> and I have no idea. I just depend on the Holy Spirit. I have no idea about your life. But God does. Now the Lord came to Jonah the second time, and he said to him, he said, Go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the proclamation, which I'm going to tell you. Told him the same thing, chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. You see, my point is that God's desire for the spiritually advancing believer, even Jonah, who's been in carnal and disciplined, it is his desire for you to do his will. Doing the will of God from the heart, Ephesians 6, 6. Because you see, Hebrews eleven six. 6, without faith it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. That's the story of Jonah. Paul's instruction to us on the shore would be walk by faith, not by sight. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. Now let me conclude. Here is what we've learned from Jonah's prayer about praying without ceasing. It doesn't matter how long you pray. It doesn't matter how fervently you pray. If you do not pray according to the will of God with a desire to do his will, your prayer will not be answered. But if you do it with that desire, it will be 1 John 5, 14 and 15. In Colossians 4, 12, Paul applauds Epaphras, who is one of your number, he writes, a bond slave of Jesus Christ, he sends you his greetings, always laboring earnestly for you in his prayers that you may stand perfect and fully assured in all of the will of God. You see, that's what it's about, people. That's what it's about. Listen to Philippians 4, 6 and 7. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplications with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God, and the peace of God, which passes all comprehension, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. So Paul writes in Colossians 4, 2, and 3, devote yourself to prayer. Keep an alert in your prayer with an attitude of thanksgiving. Gratitude of attitude, attitude of gratitude. It is with an attitude of thanksgiving, praying at the same time for us as well. Here's my prayer. Here's my prayer if you pray one for me. That God may open to us a door for the word so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ for which we have been imprisoned. Well, I have been imprisoned yet. 
but I'm praying for, I'm not praying for that, but I'm praying for an open door. Now, in our lesson today, we have studied one aspect of praying without ceasing. We have studied Jonah praying without intervals of space and time. Next week, I'm going to return with this, pray without ceasing, and I'm going to talk about intervals of space and time, praying without ceasing with intervals of space and time. I uh, hope you'll come back with us and be with us next Wednesday as I conclude this message with showing you another side to praying without ceasing. Let us pray. And so, our Father, we thank you today for your love, mercy, and grace and the things you have provided for us through the Internet, for a wonderful staff that does it, and people who are willing to set aside an hour and study with us. I pray, Father, this message would bring sense to those who are running and appeal to those who are running for the Lord and not from Him. It's running either way, but it's not healthy to run away from the Lord. Where are you going? But running with Him and for Him is the name of the game. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.